Hello everyone, this is your host for Latina Role Models, Damaris Ramos, and tonight we have Raquel Fernandez. And this is going to be a very special interview because I'm going to get to know her at the same time that she's talking to all of us. So this is going to be very interesting. Raquel, Lauri, Lauri was the one who um, referred you to be interviewed. Correct. So, what do you think she referred you? What is it new that she's like, you need to know more about her? Laudi is a really good friend of mine. Uh, we actually met through work. Uh, she works for the city and I work for the county, so that's how we got to know each other. And since then, we just clicked. We became really good friends. She is a power woman, as you might, as you mm -hmm. probably know, since mm -hmm. you know her. She's a, she's a driver at the office of Commission Antonio Ortiz, and I guess... We kind of identified, because since I worked for Mr. Randall, we both work for an elected official and we're out and about and mm -hmm. we're staffing them and we're making stuff happen. So I guess that's probably why. So tonight's about you. So tell me more about you. You told me that you're coming from Venezuela. Yes, Go I ahead. come from Venezuela. I was born in Maracaibo, so La Tierra del Sol Amada. Of this heat, I'm kind of used to it, but mm -hmm. I moved here to the United States when I was, when I was 16. My parents decided to migrate um, because of uh, security reasons. The situation in Venezuela was already deteriorating, and we had a vacation home here, so they were already acclimate, acclimated to the United States. They knew the system, so they mm -hmm. decided to come over. And it seems like they were kind of like preparing, you know, the move at some point with the, with the house right here. But tell me a little bit more about your life in Venezuela as a child. Um, well, my life in Venezuela as a child, I developed, my childhood developed in Venezuela. I, I say that my childhood was developed in Venezuela and then my professional life developed here in the United States. But the, the most vivid memories I have of Venezuela, part of it is the music. I love the music and I still miss the music and the flavors. You know, probably, you're from Puerto Rico, correct? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Probably when you go back to the island, you know, one of the things that brings you back to your childhood is those smells and the flavors and the food. Mm -hmm. And then you hear the music everywhere and it's kind of, you know, that's one of the most vivid memories I have of my country. And all my family is there, it's still except there. for my parents and my sisters. Other than that, everybody's in Venezuela. Have you been able to go back to visit Venezuela? Once I became a resident and I had my green card, I was able to come back and forth. I, then I became a citizen a year ago, and my parents, I was able to sponsor them a process that usually takes six months. It took over a year. Yeah. Um, and they came in, my mom came in on in February, and my dad came in on April of this year. So you mentioned during the, uh, when you were in Venezuela, that's when you were, uh, your formative years. Right. So then you, you're, when you came here, you were already, you know, like your, your mind was already <coughs> formed, so you probably have certain ideas. So let's get back to Venezuela and tell me how this idea started developing, what things, you know, triggering you, because you mentioned details about you about language, you speak four languages. Correct. How does that happen? Well, um, I, went, I grew up in a bilingual household. My mom is Ita my mom. My family from my mom's side is Italian, so they speak Italian. Um, that's how I learned how to speak Italian. And then, of course, I was born in Venezuela, so I speak Spanish. But English was introduced to me on an early age because I studied in international school. I had profess I had teachers all the way from New Delhi, in, uh, India, from Canada. So from all these different the accents. States. Correct. And then we had the opportunity, believe it or not, Venezuela is actually really big on languages, what it is English, and especially the private schools, I don't know if it's the same in Puerto Rico, you mm -hmm. have the public and you have the private, but you have the French, La Alianza Francesa in, um, in Venezuela as well. So I was introduced to French also the same time I was introduced to English, so I was learning practically two languages. Well, like it, it sounds like it, it has more um, rich, uh, it's more developed when it comes to languages, because Puerto Rico, yeah, Public and private, they'll do English. Mm -hmm. But then I guess you have to go to an extra mile to develop all these other languages. Yes, there are actually schools that are focused on teaching more than just English and Spanish. Um, but we, we have those resources available, that's what I meant to say. So when you grew up, um, who was around grandparents? So who, as, who were influencing you when you were growing up as a right. child? As a like, you know, as our Latin culture, we're very, very attached to our family. You know, we have an entire family of 
twenty cousins, mm-hmm. you know, a hundred aunts, and um, so my grandparents were a big part of it. So going back to the music, actually, so both all of my grandparents, four of them are alive currently. Um, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents from my dad's side and they were very intellectual and they would play classical music and they would play folkloric music and we had instruments all over the house. That's great. And then my grandma actually spoke French as well and from my mom's side uh, it was more about the sciences because my grandfather is an oncologist, dermatologist, so they were a really big influence. Um, I would say three of my four grandparents are doctors but I actually went for political science. So I, I like to call myself like the black sheep of the family when it comes to education. Um, but then I found out that I even, I have part of my family, uh, my great grandma, regardless if she was illiterate, she started a political party in Venezuela. Oh, wow. And so I blame it on her. <laughs> so. You found someone to blame. Still someone to blame, yes. So 16 years old, you come to the United States. How was that? Because the language was not an issue. Um, it was tough. I left my friends. I think as a teenager, those are very critical years. You're very attached to your um, nucleus of, of friends. You have your boyfriends, Aww. you know, <laughs> at your high school mm. relationships. And then you leave your entire family. And it was a cultural shock compared to my sisters that were younger. They, it was easier for them to adapt. You know, they cry the first week and then they moved on. But I, it was tough. Culturally, it was tough. Um, thankfully, I did speak English, so I was able to kind of connect. Mm-hmm. Come here, girl, huh? But um, I think that... What makes it so strong for you? Because like the language was there, you have your immediate family, I guess. The extended family was no longer there. Right. I think what makes it harder for me is the cultural shock. You know, you come in and you talk to your friends and, for example, um, sleepovers. Sleepovers in Venezuela is not a big thing unless the families know each other, you know. They t- not, not tend to leave their kids in another, mm-hmm. sleep in another household. So, but in here is very common. So I, I joined, uh, since I've always loved sports, I joined the water polo team and the swim team and the girls always wanted to have sleepovers and it's not that my parents didn't let me sleep over, mm-hmm. I didn't feel comfortable spending the night or the time. Because that's not what you're used exactly. to. Exactly. Yeah. So things like that, you know, like lunch, uh, something funny, um, in here is very common just to have a sandwich for lunch and, you know, like a yogurt or something like that, that for us is more of a snack. I was, you know, lunch what was, for what me was a normal lunch? is el arroz con plátano, carne, you know, rice, beans, meat, and that oh. was 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 served in the cafeteria. Cool too. Yeah, that's that's what we had. So when I came in <laughs> and my mom packed me a huge lunch and my my oh, when classmate you see that with other kids, uh huh, with their sandwich, I was like, oh my god, that's so sad. <laughs> Would you like some of mine, you know? <laughs> so little things like that, that make you, I guess, homesick. Did you get more Americanized through the time and you, you start bringing your smaller lunch at some point? Um, so you know how I told you my childhood development happened in Venezuela and then my professional development happened mm-hmm. here? I wouldn't call it completely Amer- Americanized, but, and this is what I think it's so great about this country since it has so many cultures, is I was able to understand the culture, embrace it, and mix it with mine. What have you still kept from Venezuela that you're like, okay, because probably you still bring it. Did you still bring it on big lunches? No, I still bring the big lunches to the office and you can ask my coworkers and it's like, what do you have today? And I pack a lot so I can share it. Because I don't like eating part, alone. And that's part of the culture too, to yes. share. So what is it about Venezuela that you're still keeping? Even though you're saying, well, I'm here, you know, like other people do it that way, but I'm still doing this. Is there something you're still keeping from Venezuela, from your culture? That's a good question. But the food is one. We know yes, that. the food is one. I would say almost everything. In my house, we speak Spanish, and I just recently got engaged three weekends ago to a Russian. Wow. So... And 
Is that the new language that you're going to learn? What? Is that the new language that you're going to learn? I'm trying. Yes, I'm trying. I have to understand what their family is speaking at the dinner table. Of you know? course. <laughs> he seems to understand ours already. He speaks, uh, he understands Spanish. He will speak it very little. But um, uh, that's part of it in my family. My family is the biggest you thing. You're still connected with yes. them. Tell me a little bit more about what you're doing right now. Um, so actually, it's a fun fact about me, I do volunteer for the Hispanic Heritage Committee of the county, and as you might know, it is Hispanic Heritage Month, so our kickoff was today at the county, so that's something really big. Mm -hmm. um, one of my hobbies is I am very fitness oriented, and I love doing CrossFit and trying new things. So apart from surfing, I like to do CrossFit. I've participated at events before. Do I win? No, but I don't make it last. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. something about me. Um, currently, I'm also a young alumni. Uh, I'm in the Young Alumni Council at UCF. So my time... So I you graduated from UCF? Yes, I'm okay. a proud knight. Um, my hobby will be helping others and kind of mentoring. I love... I get satisfaction from seeing others thrive professionally. So that's what I've been trying to do. How you're mixing this with your current job? Because you are working with the community. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel sometimes because it's I'm the face, you know, I'm always outside for the tax collector's office. I feel sometimes that it's really hard, and my job is part of what I am or what I do. Um, but whenever I'm at different events for certain, you know, organizations that I'm volunteering or whatnot, I do find people that know that I work for the tax collector's office. So, you know, you always have to behave mm -hmm. your best. Um, but I just try to make a point that I'm here for this or I'm here for a specific reason other than just working for the tax collector. Working with the with tax collector, what do you think has been one of your biggest impact with the community? What it has been, you know, one of those areas that you're like, I would like to continue more of that. Because sometimes, I, I manage a community center for the government too, so we're, we're working for the same entity. And there are certain events, or there are certain things that I do, and I'm like, I would like to continue work like more with the youth. Okay, that's a good question. I feel, and I've said it before, um, I'm the bridge between the community mm -hmm. and a government. Like that, that liaison connection, Office. definitely. I am the one that's able to hear what the constituent thinks and bring it back to the community or vice versa, you know. Um, something, like I said, that sparked me, and not just because I'm a knight, but it got me so involved with the university, is that um, meeting other young professionals at either chamber events or at other community events and the, the importance of just higher education or mentoring other people and saying it's like hey no matter what career you go into um, a lot of times is who you know and who you meet and how you meet them yeah. and opportunities will open up so that's something why that sparked me on helping, on volunteering, uh, at, for example, a young alumni, and even the Hispanic Heritage Committee. I was in the subcommittee that uh, picked the recipient of the scholarship today. So that being said, and these are going to be our last words, um, for women who looked at you and they admire you, what would be your recommendation? My recommendation is, first, I am a Christian, so God you know, knows always what's best for you. And my recommendation is persistent. A lot of times we get scared and we don't know where to go or what to do or what the future brings us. But as long as we're persistent on what we believe and our, you know, our, our moral our integrity, that would be my advice. Just keep keep that integrity and be persistent. Fight for what you what you want. It has been a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Damaris. This has been Damaris Ramos for Latino Models. Thank you and good night.